Today, I'm going to be talking about visionary leadership. And we're getting into what I mean by visionary leadership, specifically with what it means for multilingualism. I just want to situate my work a little bit within kind of a broader context. Um, so I do work with some amazing people in the School District of Philadelphia. Some of them are at this table right here, fairly people, um, who are trying to do a lot of really amazing things in terms of affirming the multilingualism of students in the School District of Philadelphia. Um, the Philadelphia has a lot of um, things happening. Um, so Philadelphia is the fourth most segregated city in the country. Um, 48% of children are living in poverty zones. Um, there are lots of things that have been produced by lots of really bad public policies. Um, public policies that for decades have disinvested from primarily communities of color. Those things need to be addressed. Um, but teachers in classrooms can't necessarily address all of those issues. Um, and so I say that at the beginning just to kind of put that out there as something that we have to understand in terms of the context that many of our teachers are in in schools while trying to focus on what is our locus of control as educators in classrooms and what are the things that we can actually impact in the lives of our children knowing that there are all these other factors and issues that we as a society also need to address if we really want to deal with the root causes of the inequalities that face our society. Um, one way that I think we can do that in schools is through visionary leadership. Um, and so what is visionary leadership? So I just kind of came up with this definition last night when I was finalizing my presentation, so it might not work yet. Um, but um, so it's leadership that facilitates student learning while affirming their identities. Um, and to affirm the identities of bi and multilingual students of color, I don't know why students are here twice, I just did this morning. Students, students of color requires leadership that goes that oftentimes goes against the grain of societal norms, right? And so my work and my scholarship focuses primarily on the experiences of bi and multilingual students of color. And so in the U.S. society, for example, um, when a white student speaks Spanish, that's usually seen as like a really good thing, right? That's so great that that child speaks Spanish. But when a Latino child speaks Spanish, oftentimes that's spread very differently, right? That's like, oh my God, that kid is never going to learn English because they speak Spanish. And so in U.S. society, bi and multilingualism is oftentimes um, celebrated when powerful and privileged people have it, but it's oftentimes marginalized or seen as a barrier when students of color and communities of color do it. And so I think part of what it means to be a visionary leader is to work against that grain. To see the bi and multilingualism of our communities and students of color as something that should be centered to the work that we're doing in schools and in classrooms. And so you see this nice person here going against <laughs> the grain by trying to climb up while everyone else is going down. Um, and I thought that was kind of a nice image to kind of say what I'm thinking it means to really be a visionary leader. Um, and so I want to start by thinking of common descriptions that are used for bi and multilingual students of color in schools. And, and begin to get us to rethink whether these are the terms that we want to use if we're actually being visionary leaders. So one, of course, is English language learners or English learner or some variation on it. Um, another that I hear um, in some schools that I've worked with in the many years that I've been working in schools is not having a strong foundation in any language. Um, another one that I've, I've heard is lacking academic language. Another one that I've heard is speaking improperly. Um, these are terms that are looking at students what, from what I would say is a deficit perspective, the things that they don't have. Um, so if they're English language learners, that's all they are, right? They don't have other languages that are part of their repertoire. Um, if they don't have a strong foundation in any language, which is from a linguistic perspective, a theoretical, like that's not a thing linguistically that doesn't make any sense. Um, but when we describe students that way, we're describing them from a deficit framing. When we say that they're lacking in academic language, we're saying that they lack something, right? That there's something that they're missing. And then when we say they're speaking improperly, we're saying that there's something wrong with them. So I think visionary leadership would start from reframing the very terms that we use to describe these students. Um, and so here are some things that I'm going to be talking about in this presentation as ways that I think that we can begin to reframe how it is that we talk about these students. So instead of calling them English learners or English language learners, why don't we just call them bilingual or multilingual? 
Um, because if they've been in your class for a day, then they are already bilingual or multilingual, right? Um, and so rather than saying that they are English language learners, why don't we start from the fact that they actually are bilingual and multilingual, and that that's something that we should celebrate, and that's something that we should build on in our classrooms. Rather than saying that they don't have a strong foundation in any language, we can talk about how they engage, they are engaged in metalinguistic conversations at home and school. The bold terms are terms that I'm going to be defining throughout the presentation, so we're going to come back to this at the end. Hopefully it'll make more sense. Uh, um, rather than saying that they're lacking a faith on this language, we can argue about the ways that they're engaged in language architecture at home and in school. And rather than saying that they speak improperly, we can say that they're language architects who shift language to accommodate their audience. So my argument in this presentation is that our children already do this on a daily basis, and I'm going to give you examples of students doing this on a daily basis. And I think that if we reframe students this way, and they afford us new pedagogical approaches and new curricular approaches that actually see the bilingualism of multilingual students not as a barrier to learning, or not even necessarily as just a bridge to learning, but as something that's legitimate in its own right. So what are metalinguistic conversations? Um, metalinguistic conversations focus on the ways that language works. Um, all of us engage in metalinguistic conversations as part of the, our socialization in language. So whenever we're talking about a funny word, or we're saying, I, I like that way that person speaks, or I don't like that accent, these are metalinguistic conversations that we're having. Um, Bi and multilingualism oftentimes offer unique affordances for engaging in metalinguistic conversations precisely because students are navigating multiple main languages at the same time, right? And so I'm not suggesting that bi and multilingual people are the only people who engage in metalinguistic conversations. Everybody does, but that when you're negotiating multiple languages, you have unique affordances for doing that that I think could be built on more in the classrooms that we work in. So as an example, um, of kind of the types of things that happen. We have what is soy milk, it's just regular milk introducing itself in Spanish. And so, of course, soy in Spanish means I am, right? And in English it means like soy, like that bean or whatever that you use to make milk sometimes. And so in order to get the joke, you have to have at least some understanding of Spanish in order to kind of understand the double meaning that's being done there. Um, and so oftentimes, these types of kind of bilingual jokes are things that bi bilingual people do on a regular basis, and they're oftentimes having metalinguistic conversations about it. They kind of talk about, ha 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 ha, that's so funny, and then someone else will come up with a different joke that says some words in a different way. Um, and so, because of the nature of putting these languages into contact with each other, oftentimes facilitates unique opportunities for having and facilitating metalinguistic conversations. So, I'm going to look at like, some examples of metalinguistic conversations in action. So, it's going to give you a more concrete idea of what this means. So, one, it can be a conversation about whether the N word can be used as a term of endearment, which is one that many people may have seen young people having conversations about, and, and adults as well, because there certainly is a consensus on that. Um, discussions are the best way to translate a particular English word into Spanish. Translation is very hard. And, by design required in the linguistic conversation. Debates about whether the term amigos is in fact gender neutral, as many suggest, which is a huge debate happening right now in the Spanish language about whether we should have the O at all, whether we should change it to an X, for example, or something that some people are proposing. So adults haven't figured this out, right? We're, we're still having meta linguistic conversations about some of these really complex issues. I observed all of these conversations in a dual language charter school in a low income, primarily Latino area of Philadelphia. This was all when they were in first and second grade. Um, so these are first and second graders who were having these metalinguistic conversations. This wasn't adults trying to debate the nuances of language. This was young children who have already observed the complexity of language and were conversing with each other primarily about these issues. Um, and so I want us to think back to that first slide where bi and multilingual students of color are oftentimes described as lacking. Um, and contrast that with this rephrase, this 
reframe that I think is more of a visionary leadership style of looking at the many kind of complex and interesting observations that young children from these communities already are making on a daily basis without the teacher being involved in any of these conversations. The students were kind of figuring this out alone at lunch or when they were at stations and kind of these, you know how at stations sometimes spontaneous conversations come up and so forth. And so I think this reframe can kind of move us away from correction to guidance, right? And I think this resonates a lot with the previous presentation in many ways, um, where so often the instinct is we have to correct these students in order to teach them the right way, rather than trying to correct them, begin with the observation that these are really amazing children doing all kinds of really interesting things with language, um, and that our job as adults who have more experience with how language works and the conventions of language is to help guide them as they begin to decide how they're going to take a stance on these various issues that are emerging in their lives, such as whether they should ever use the N-word or whether it's ever appropriate for them to do that, or whether they should um, say amigos, or they should say amigos and amigas, or they should say amiguettes, or whatever it is that they decide for themselves. Again, because adults haven't figured this out, we haven't decided. Um, and so when we, if we move to kind of a guidance model, the language is understood as working differently in different contexts, right? So there are different contexts of language use. And the role of the teacher is to facilitate metalinguistic conversations about the different uses of language, and importantly, to support students in making connections between the language practices that they're already familiar with and new language practices associated with various school tasks, right? And so my goal as a teacher is then, one, to help students become more aware of the complex ways that they already use language, um, and then to make connections between the complex ways they already use language with the complex ways they're expected to use language in school. And notice that I use complex to describe both of those practices. There's nothing inherently more complex about what we want children to do in school than what they're already doing outside of school. Um, and I think when we start from that perspective as visionary leaders, it really allows us to do different types of things in classrooms. And so I'm going to give you an example that emerged from uh, a different dual language bilingual classroom that I worked with um, to kind of give you a sense of what this kind of language guidance might look like. Um, and I'm going to play the audio clip, but I'd like to use my bilingual brain. I'll explain more about the context of this in a bit. But interesting you know if I were reading this in English you actually kind of say when I visit her in Chile but when you read it with your bilingual brain you say when I visit her in Chile so do you see that difference there when I, but visit I like her to use my Chile. bilingual brain so I'm gonna, it's when I visit her in Chile so they were engaged in a guided writing then, which is why the students are reading along with her as she writes. Um, but she stopped for a moment here um, to make an observation about language, right? So this was a bilingual classroom. All of the students were coming from home for Spanish was spoken. Um, and all of them specifically <coughs> pronounced the country, Chile, even though the lesson was in English. Um, all of the students did it. She even did it as the teacher. Um, and then she stopped herself to kind of make this observation about, well, this is interesting, right? Like, we are using English right now, but we're all describe we're all using Chile to talk about this country. Um, that is our bilingual brains working, right? So rather than, one, telling them, no, this is English time, we should pronounce it in English, which I don't think would have made any sense in this context. Um, two, or just ignoring it, she decided to kind of stop for a moment to notice it, right? And to say, hi, that's interesting that we're doing that. Um, this particular interaction, which I'm, and I'm gonna talk about this more in a bit, was part of an actual planned unit of instruction. So this wasn't just spontaneous. Um, this particular example was, um, I mean, it was spontaneous in the sense that the, the teacher did this on her own, but it was part of a unit of instruction where she was already thinking about how she was going to build on the student's bilingualism and how she was going to facilitate these metalinguistic conversations in the classroom. As part of a unit that I developed with some colleagues at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and so these types of interactions happen in classrooms on a daily basis oftentimes. Teachers will stop themselves and kind of make interesting observations. The point that I would like to make in this presentation is that it's more 
systematic and reflective on how we do it, we can actually do it in ways that actually enhance student learning. Yes? Yeah. And so, thinking about the students that we perspective, this moves us from memorization um, to language exploration. Um, so rather than trying to get students to memorize appropriate language use, really getting them to explore the ways that language actually works in everyday interaction through engaging students in metalinguistic conversation. Um, and these metalinguistic conversations can be about language practices that they're already familiar with. They can be about the language choices of uh, mentor text and thinking about the language choices of a particular author, which is getting to author's craft, which is of course a big part of the common core standards. Um, and then really helping them to think about the similarities and differences between the language choices of mentor text with language practices that they're already familiar with. Right? And really getting to people, why is the author using this type of language that may be very different than the type of language that I'm used to, right? And that's different than saying, this is academic and what you're doing is non-academic, right? It's, it's trying to get out of this normative way of thinking about language, to really think about this author is using language differently than you. Why do you think that's the case, right? Um, and it's also meant to be descriptive as opposed to prescriptive, right? We want to understand why authors are doing it and we want to describe what they're doing rather than saying, you should do exactly what this author does, right? And so I'm going to give you some examples of young children engaging in this type of metalinguistic conversations. And the first one, just to kind of situate here, let me just back because you're going to start reading it and you're going to um, um, the, the first one was in a context, this was a child who was in first grade. And we've been following these students at this charter school from kindergarten. They're now in third grade. Um, this child was, this conversation happened when this particular child was in first grade. In kindergarten, she only had one teacher as her teacher, and her teacher talked her in English and in Spanish. And the teacher pronounced her name Arelis. In first grade, she had two teachers. She had a teacher who was teaching her in Spanish, and another teacher who was teaching her in English. The teacher who taught her in Spanish pronounced it Arelis. The teacher who, who taught in English pronounced it Arelis. And so one of my doctoral students, who has already been thinking about language in these ways and the ways that I am, was really interested in this phenomenon and was really interested in getting Arelis' thoughts about why it was she thought that this might be the case. Um, and so this is the interaction that occurred after my doctoral student asked her about these different pronunciations of her name. Actually, can I ask you a question? How do you like people to say your name? Because your teachers last year and this year have said it differently. It's okay, but I can't pronounce it right. Okay. It's okay. So, how do you pronounce it? How, how do you say it? Arelis. Arelis. Arelis is in English. Okay. And Arelis is in Spanish? Arelis is in English. Sometimes they call me Arelis. Oh, they sort of mix it up. So, they do some from both pronunciations? Yeah. <laughs> So I like giving this example because it's, it's in many ways a very mundane example, right? Just like her describing something that's just part of her everyday life that she has never even thought about before. And I think in some ways she seems to be, like the question to her seems to be like a silly question. She's kind of like, why are you even asking this question? Clearly, Arellis is in English and Arellis is in Spanish. And then some people kind of mix it up and do this kind of thing that's kind of a mix of two. Um, but, and, so, and so it's such a mundane, everyday example to her. But she's illustrating really sophisticated understandings of the working of language in this everyday mundane interaction, right? So she's illustrating an understanding that people who speak Spanish pronounce her name a certain way. People who speak English pronounce it another way. And then there are these people who kind of like are doing this other thing, which she, she can't really explain because they're kind of just mixing it up. And she doesn't know what's going on there. Um, and this is what I mean by the unique affordances of bilingualism and multilingualism in facilitating this type of language exploration. Just as part of her everyday life, this example has emerged, um, and she is able to articulate a really sophisticated understanding of what exactly is happening here. Um, I'm going to give you another example. Um, frijoles or habichuelas. Those of you who know Spanish know that frijoles and habichuelas can be quite contested in terms of which one is the correct word to use. Um, and it came up in the lunchroom. So this one is a little loud. 
Um, I apologize for how long things can be, but the conversation just emerged on whether frijoles or habichuelas was the correct term for bean. Um, and then the student begins to talk about it with one of my other doctoral students. <laughs> what is that? What is in Spanish? Frijoles? Frijoles? What do you say? It's coffee holes. Is it abitrellas or Some of the people who had attended bilingual institutes in Philadelphia with me remember the first time I presented this example with bilingual teachers in Philadelphia, we then got into a fight about whether Abitrela or Pinholis was the correct term, and I was like, wait, that's actually not the reason that I gave the example. But I did find it really interesting that the teachers immediately got really engaged in talking about the differences between the varieties of language based on country, right? And I was like, wait, you love talking about these differences. Your, ch your students also love talking about these differences, right? So maybe we should be thinking about how to more systematically include discussions of those differences in our um, classrooms. And so again, this wasn't the one term. This was just something that spontaneously emerged. Um, and again, because my doctoral students are kind of mold because they're interested in facilitating those types of discussions, um, they sometimes will ask questions to get the students to begin um, to, to engage in these conversations. Um, but you'll see, as they go through the interaction, um, one of the students talked about, in my home, we call it, we call it frijoles, right? And so, again, they're thinking about my own lived experience, and in my experience, they call it this. And then student four here says, that's in Mexico. The implied assumption, I believe, of that was that Abichuelas was then a Caribbean thing, because all of the other students in the interaction were from Puerto Rico or the Dominican Republic, or their parents were from Puerto Rico or the Dominican Republic. And so I think that student right there, is articulating and understanding that different countries have different words to describe these things, right? Um, that child is saying, well, in Mexico they call it frijoles, and in Puerto Rico they call it abicuelas, right? And then someone explains to me at some point that abicuela does mean something in Mexico, but it's like a specific type of bean, um, or like at least where they come from in Mexico. Um, and, so, and the point isn't really whether the students are providing an accurate variation in sociolinguistic analysis of these issues, right? Um, but the point is that they are making sense of their lived experience, and they are trying to understand the ways that language works, um, and, and, and trying to explain language difference and language diversity and what that may mean. Um, and again, as I said, when I presented this to teachers before, they got really engaged in this conversation. And of course, the children here were also very engaged in the conversation. This might be a type of conversation we might like to have more in classrooms. In particular, in bilingual classrooms, um, where, and at least in Philadelphia, there are English-Spanish programs, um, the English-Spanish tend to be treated as monolithic things, but of course there's lots of diversity within what constitutes English and what constitutes Spanish, right? Um, and so, as, as we're moving away from memorization, and we're also moving away from repetition, um, to what I have called language architecture. And when we think of an architect, an architect cannot just do whatever they want, right? I think sometimes that I, people misunderstand what I'm saying to suggest, oh, students can just do whatever they want, who cares? And if an architect did whatever they want, buildings would collapse, right? <laughs> um, they can do whatever they want, but each of them has their own unique design, right? Um, this building has a unique design that decisions went into the construction of. Um, and so an architect follows general conventions of what it means to build a building while making personal decisions that reflect their own unique design patterns or the design vision, right? Their own unique vision of what it should look like. Similarly, a language architect cannot just do whatever they want. If they did whatever they want, people wouldn't understand them. Right? There are certain conventions about how you communicate with other people um, that you have to follow in order to be understood. But within that, there is lots of room 
for design work, right? So the way that I'm presenting right now um, is a particular form of language architecture, right? Uh, I'm not just following a script. I'm engaging in kind of formal and informal ways of speaking. I'm putting jokes here and there. I have visuals that kind of help us do these things. Um, this reflects my unique style and voice as a presenter. Um, and sometimes I worry that we want our children to write and speak like textbooks. And that's not going to help them be successful in the world. And I can tell you from personal experience, when I go to academic conferences and people present like they're a textbook, nobody's listening. Um, <laughs> because it's hard to engage with somebody who's not engaging you on a personal level in some way, right? Who's not showing you that they're a real person, who has passions, who has who cares about these issues. Um, and I think that's what we want our children to be able to do, right? We want them to present themselves in ways that they're going to be legitimized, but we want them to do that in a way that reflects who they are and their unique voice and their unique experiences. <coughs> and so this is an example of um, kind of the beginnings of language architecture in this same classroom. And again, this was with one of my doctoral students. So I don't know if everyone here knows the store Five Below. Mm, yeah, most people do. It's a store where everything is five dollars or less. Um, and so this was Spanish time of the day, and the students were supposed to write about um, mi lugar favorito, so it's their, their favorite place. And of course, who doesn't love Five Below? Because you can get anything from there for five dollars or less. And I'm sure when he goes there, his parents will get him something because it's like less than five dollars. It's not very expensive, and they have like cute toys and things that you can get for less than five dollars. And so. He has to write in Spanish about his lugar favorito, but doesn't know how to say five below in Spanish. Of course, the reason being that even though he's coming from a home where Spanish is spoken, I'm sure when his family goes to that store, they just call it five below, right? <laughs> they say, vamos a five below, a comprar algo. And because our children don't live in Spanish time in English time, right? That's not how they live their lives. Um, we had Spanish time and English time in our school because if not, we would drive teachers crazy because they wouldn't know what language they were supposed to be instructing and when. Um, but that within that, we have to provide spaces for the children to really engage um, with the fact that their lives aren't as neatly compartmentalized in that way. Right? Um, and so this is, this is um, Javier is asking um, one of my doctoral students, Mark, who oftentimes, you know, there's another adult in the classroom, they just see that as another teacher, right? Um, he's asking him how to say five below in Spanish. Um, and it's a, there's a little negotiation at the beginning when you see that it takes a, it takes a few turns for Mark to understand what he's asking. Um, and then once he does, they kind of have this funny interaction with how you might say it in Spanish. We say pido. Okay. We say pido, um, where? Okay. Dice pido, pido en pañón, pido. ¿Qué ideas son importantes para ti? Sí, ya estás. Ya voy. Es un lugar. Pido. Oh, 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 the store, right? Uh, cinco abajo. Maybe you just call it five below. <laughs> unsatisfied with Mark's answer because I think he's thinking about cinco abajo that doesn't make any sense um, because like abajo doesn't mean below in the way that it means in English it, it, it doesn't make sense in Spanish to say something is cinco abajo um, and if you notice at the beginning Javier is only interested in how to say below right he knows how to say five in Spanish um, but he's wondering about how to say below, but he's unsatisfied with Mark's answer here, right? So he's showing an understanding that it's okay to reject somebody's suggestion <laughs> if it doesn't make sense. Um, and he went and asked his teacher, and she also had a similar kind of confusion about it, and was like, I don't know how you would say that in Spanish. And so in the end, Javier decided to put cinco below. <laughs> He decided to do that because below was what was really causing him the confusion. It wasn't the five. And so he was like, you know what? I'm just going to put below here, um, and I'm sure it will be fine. In some ways, he's showing an understanding of language architecture, right? He's like, wait, what they're telling me doesn't make sense, 
So I'm going to construct my text in a way that makes sense for me, right? And and Mark and I have talked more about like, I mean, because this happened in like such a, such a quick moment, like how perhaps it could have been possible to even further this conversation to really help him to see what his options were, right? Like, so he could have put single something. I mean, I don't know how it would be the best way of translating it to Spanish anyway. Um, or menos de cinco, menos de cinco maybe would be the best way of translating it to Spanish. Um, or you could keep it in English because that's how everyone in his family calls it. Um, or you could do single below or whatever it is. Like, to give him his various options and kind of help him to understand that he as the author is able to make that decision for himself. Um, and so, so now I'm going to look at what I call a, a visionary bilingual classroom within this kind of broader theoretical framework. And so what I like to do in my work, well, one is because my, my research is in bilingual classrooms. Um, but I like to center bilingual classrooms because so often bilingual teachers have to go to meetings that are about monolingual classrooms and then they have to figure out how to apply it in a bilingual context, right? So they go to professional development that's really not focused on bilingual education at all and then they have to figure out how to adapt it. Um, so I like to reverse that sometimes and say, well, let's start with what happens in bilingual classrooms and figure out how it can be adapted to a monolingual context. And I think doing that with teachers who teach in monolingual classrooms that I've done before has really allowed them to see the types of language that exist in a classroom differently. Um, and I think that gets back to Amelia's kind of point, you know, when we focus on kind of the most marginalized, it really helps us improve practices for all of our students. So I'm going to start with a bilingual classroom and then I'm going to extend from that what I think we could learn for schools that are more multilingual than that, where there isn't just one language, but there are multiple languages. In this particular school, it's English and Spanish. I know many of you probably work for schools that have many languages in them, so I'm going to extend what I think we can learn from this particular classroom to kind of a whole school model where there may be multiple languages. Um, and so, this is Ms. Lopez's is pseudonym. Um, some of the people at this table know who it is. And she was uh, a teacher in a predominantly Latino and high poverty area in Philadelphia. This is a different school than the school where we just visited with those students who were doing the other things. Um, just to give you a sense of the demographic, 74% Latino, 25% English language learner, which is far higher than the average in Philadelphia, which is about 10%. 100% um, economic disadvantage, which is actually fairly common for the school district of Philadelphia. Um, this was a second grade classroom. The teacher was a U.S. born um, Latina. Um, there were 17 students in the class and all of the students came from home were Spanish just spoken. Um, and most of the students were reading below grade level according to school assessment data. Um, so this was a second grade classroom. About maybe half were at the first grade level and then about almost half were at a considered a kindergarten level on the DRA that they were, that they were still doing then. Um, and so just to give you a sense of the context, right? This was the context where we did this particular unit plan that was trying to apply this language architecture that really embraces the bilingualism of the student. Um, and so what we organized the unit around was translingual mentor text. Um, and so translingual mentor text is a text that in this case was primarily written in English, um, but the author decided to put some Spanish in the text that was primarily in English. And so we use the picture book Abuela, which is right here. Um, some of you may be familiar with it. So Abuela is a story about a young girl who flies around the city with her grandmother, her abuela. They call, she calls her abuela throughout the story. The, the city seems to be New York City, but they never actually name it. Um, and besides choosing abuela to, just, to talk about grandmother throughout the whole story, whenever abuela speaks, um, the dialogue is also in Spanish. Um, and so we were interested in helping the students do a close reading of the text to try to understand, one, that the author decided to use Spanish in the text, um, two, to get them to think about why the author would do that, um, and three, to get them to see that this particular author decided to provide clues for people who can't read Spanish, but they understood what Abuela said. Um, not all bilingual authors will do that, right? Some consciously decide not to translate so that if you don't understand the language well then you're going to struggle with it differently. Um, but this particular author did provide clues so we were looking at that. Um, 
And I want to talk a little bit about closed reading because closed reading is um, a common course reading strategy now, right? People are always talking about closed reading. Um, one of the debates that has emerged in the field on closed reading is whether or not you should build on students' background knowledge. And I'm going to give you my opinion, and then you can agree or disagree with it. Um, but I think, for me, to engage students in a complex literacy practice in ways that doesn't connect to their background knowledge is setting them up for failure. <laughs> Um, and so, I'm not suggesting that eventually, once they become skilled at it, that they can't do it with texts that are unfamiliar to them, but that when we're first introducing the strategy to them, it's important to do it with language practices and author's choices that are going to be familiar to them, right? So that they understand what they're doing, and then once they understood it from a text that's very familiar to them, eventually, when they get into third or fourth grade, um, they would then be able to perhaps do it with texts that are more unfamiliar to them. So we decided to do a closed reading of texts with language practices that were that we knew would be familiar to the students because we knew that all of these children in this classroom had adults in their lives who only spoke Spanish. So we knew that they would understand that. And so just to give you an outline of the unit plan, the day one was just intended to introduce the students to the, to the text. It was just a traditional read aloud that teachers have been doing forever, right? To help them comprehend what the text was about. Um, there is some kind of hinting at the author's decision to use Spanish, but they're not really looking closely at that particular aspect of the text yet. At the end of the first day, the only assignment they have is to draw a special person in their life who speaks Spanish and to label it with something. That was the goal of the first day. The second day was the first day of close reading. And so here, um, <coughs> the teacher modeled for them how to use insights from this close reading to write their own bilingual story. So the first day of the close reading, she's looking at the author's decision to use Spanish and looking at the strategies that the author uses. And then they're doing a guided writing together where she's writing about a special person in her life who speaks Spanish and using similar strategies to what the author did. And then, the students are starting to construct their own independent stories, trying to use some of those strategies. Day three, they continue with the close reading, and here the focus is on helping students see how the author provided clues to people who may not read and write in Spanish. So the, unit, the lesson begins with them thinking about times where they had to translate for somebody, which they all had experiences with. Um, and then think about, well, this is what the author is doing here, right? And this is how, these are some of the strategies that the author is using to translate, right? To help people who may not be able to read Spanish understand what Abuela is saying. The fourth slide was the culminating reading of Abuela. That was an interactive reading that was, um, each of the students had particular dialogue from Abuela that they had on um, card paper. And as the teacher read the story, they read the dialogue kind of as it came up. So they could kind of experience the story one more time, and then they were working on their story still and finishing their story. Day five, I left this open because whenever I've worked with teachers before, they never have enough time to get through everything and, and the time that we allow. So I figured day five, we had some extension activities that they could do with the students if they had time, or they could just have them finish up their story. When we actually piloted it, it was during a horrible snowstorm that happened last year. And so we actually only ended up having four days anyway. Um, and so we just left the fifth day out and didn't do anything with this day. They finished their stories in the fourth day. Um, and so I wanted to get, I give you an example of Miss Lopez engaging in the close reading to give you a sense of what it was that she was doing with the students. Spanish. Can you see from there? Okay. Yes. So look, listen closely. Today, we are going to the park. El parque es lindo, says Abuela. I know what she means. I think the park is beautiful too. So, I'm going to think about that for a second. In Spanish, Abuela said, El parque es lindo. But then Arthur Doros, the author, he puts in here, I think the park is beautiful too. So that's a clue for me. If I don't know what el parque es lindo means, okay, well, I still understand what Abuela is saying because he wrote, I think the park is beautiful too. So Arthur Doros is kind of translating here for us. You see how he did that? 
So this was during the second day of closed reading where she was focusing on the clues provided by the author. So she, she looks at several different examples from the text to help students see that the author is providing clues that translate parts of what's happening in the story for readers. So now I'm going to look at um, the kind of the progression of the guided writing that happened over multiple days. So the first day of the guided writing, remember, was just them drawing a picture and labeling it. So Miss Lopez drew a picture of her aunt who lives in Chile, which is where the Chile example came in before, um, and was going to label it. And you'll see she was going to label it apple cake, but then she stopped herself because she realized that she doesn't call it that with her idea. This was, this was she pretends that she's just figuring this out here, but this was planned. <laughs> Maybe people don't know that's an apple cake because maybe people don't know that's an apple cake, so I'm just going to label it. Apple cake. But you know what? Actually, I don't even call it apple cake. We call it um, torta de manzana. Torta? Maybe I'll write that. And so we were hoping to use this as a way of planting in the student's head that they were going to be doing something with Spanish in the story. So she was like, well, I call it a torta de manzana with my tia. So I want to reflect that authentically in the story that I write, right? I want to call it apple cake. You'll notice one of the students said torta, because torta doesn't mean the same thing in every country. And Chile apparently means cake. Um, and like the Caribbean, it kind of is like a sandwich or like something. And so we talked about that later too, in how um, that we didn't really explore that difference there. But eventually, kind of, um, I almost said her name. Ms. Lopez um, told me that later she did explore that with her students, kind of differences in time and, and both time what that might mean. Um, and so this is then her um, writing her story on the second day, the first day where she's actually writing the story. Since I drew about her teaching me how to make a torta de manzana, I need to put that in my story. Okay? She taught. Now look at this is a tricky word, but it's how you spell it. Taught. She taught. 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 She taught me how to make a torta de manzana. So you can see that the students were well prepared to expect a Spanish word to appear in the text. And the first day, Miss um, Lopez had a writing he put into their head book that the manzana was going to be one of the words. And so once it appeared, when you hear the students negotiating, but then you have Isabel kind of pointing, hey, there's a Spanish word in there. Um, because she knew that that was what was going to happen. And so, the students then constructed their own stories, and so I'm just going to share with you a few of them. Um, two of them, I have students reading their stories for us, um, and so you can kind of see the types of things that they produce. When I go to my tia's house, she tells me, Mio, ¿me puedes cargar a tu primo bebé, por favor? And I tell her, yes, tia. And my tia says, gracias, Mio. And so as we analyze this one, um, Ms. Lopez and I had a debate. So, uh, so when we were, we had a, we developed a rubric to assess these particular stories that were just focused on the bilingual strategies that we were focusing on in the unit. We weren't focusing on grammar or any of those things. And that was a conversation that she and I had that we decided wasn't necessarily going to be helpful to us um, to understand whether they understood the, the rhetorical strategies um, to, to focus on grammar. We thought that might be a distraction. Um, so we decided that this particular student was able to provide um, a quote in Spanish, which was something that the author of the text had done, um, and that um, most of the text, what the narrative was primarily in English. The clue was where there was debate. And again, at the bilingual <coughs> in Philadelphia, there was a huge debate about whether he provided a clue or not. Um, and so in the written text itself, there isn't really a clue as to what his dia asked him to do. But then there was a conversation about where the picture, where it's hard to see here, but in the original you can see better. Um, there's someone holding the baby. Um, and so then the conversation became, well, well, is the picture enough of a clue? Ms. Lopez and I decided, um, in conversation with each other, to 
count him as emerging in his understanding of providing clues because the objective was to see whether he was able to provide clues within the text itself. But the teachers of uh, the institute have strong disagreements with that. And again, I mean, these are all open for interpretation, right? Um, and so let me do the next one. <coughs> This one, there's a pause in the middle because she forgets to read the rest of her story and then you'll hear me telling her, hey, you forgot to read the rest, it was on two pages. The bottom is the second page. My mom makes cake dif different cakes, com como cheese cakes, e melon cakes, e banana cakes, and a grape cake. We bake bizcocho and chocolate cake and Mi mamá me dice, te va a encantar el chocolate del bizcocho. I don't think your story's finished yet, right? One more. And I try it, and I agree with my mom. So this was interesting because as the case happens when you model for students, right, a lot of the students took the baby in the cage, which was Ms. Lopez's example, to write their own story. So I guess a lot of them just happen to have special people in their life and baby in the cage, I don't know. But even though she uses the same example, it's not the same story. Um, and I think there is language architecture happening here. One, she doesn't use torta. She uses bizcocho, which is how it's usually described in the Caribbean and in other countries. So she's changing the term to fit authentically the way that her mother would call it. Right? Her mother doesn't call it a torta, she calls it a bizcocho. But she also adds all of these other cakes to it. Um, they're not apple cake, right? There's cheesecake and melon cake and banana cake and grape cake. I don't even know if all of these are cakes. But, um, <laughs> but she is changing the story to fit her approach. Right? She's not just copying what the teacher did. And none of the students did that. Um, the last example is an example of a student who, he didn't read his own, you'll hear Ms. Lopez reading his story. Um, but, so there was a group of like six students in the class that Ms. Lopez identified as students who needed even more scaffolding than the scaffolding that was built into the unit. These were students who were um, on the access test, they were level one students, meaning that they had just arrived to the country. Um, and many of them were also, um, struggling readers in, in both languages. And so she provided them extra support, but she provided them sentence frames and worked with them to help them construct the story. But even then, you'll see that he doesn't just follow exactly what she had laid out. He still is working to construct the story um, that fits who he is and his family. I want to make a cake for, or I like to make cake Cake with Papa. Papa is my special person. Hijo, haz el bizcocho bien. Son, make a good cake. She added some stuff here too. She added some stuff that he didn't have there. Um, and so even though, again, he's following the cake. There were lots of cake stories. Um, but he didn't. He doesn't begin in the way that she had told him to begin. She went. She, she suggested that they begin with whoever is a special person. He decided to change the order to begin with. Um, I like to make a cake, and then the use of quotation marks is certainly inconsistent in what he's doing here. He also changed the term to bizcocho. Um, he didn't use torta, so even a student who needed extra scaffolding was still able to add his own voice to the story in order to begin to develop these skills of language architecture in his writing. Um, and so now I want us to think about what this might mean for kind of looking at this school-wide and also thinking about schools um, where there may be multiple languages. In this particular school, Spanish was the language other than English that was, I think, the only language. Um, but of course, many schools have many different languages. And so I'm going to kind of give an, a vision of what it would mean to really center the multilingualism of the school community as legitimate in its own right, but as an, an integral part to the school community and the learning process. And so, one, this can begin with a multilingual landscape. So I go into so many schools where they say, we have 20 languages spoken here, we have 30 languages spoken here, and then everything is written in English everywhere. Um, and then like, there's a huge disconnect between your school community um, and the, the walls and, and the school environment, right? 
And so even something small as that, right? Um, really thinking about how the languages of the school community are presented throughout the school environment. So this can include welcome signs, this can include kind of having inspirational posters in different languages, um, labels, um, having word walls um, that, that include words in different languages, um, allowing students to write their work in languages other than English, even if that's not the target language or even if you don't understand it. Um, because then you can ask the student, after they've done it, can you translate that for me to tell me what it was that you wrote there, right? It may allow them to actually write more because they can write what they know in English, they can write what they know in their language, and then they can tell you what they wrote, right? Um, thinking about having rapid organizers in multiple languages, especially at the upper grade where students may be coming in, being able to read and write in their home <coughs> languages, right? And would benefit from, them, from that extra type of scaffolding. Um, letters home, which I think is a legal thing, but doesn't always happen, uh, but ensuring that letters go home in the languages of the school community, right? And so thinking about how multilingualism isn't just something that's an add-on, but really is a fundamental characteristic and feature of your school community. Um, thinking about the development of multilingual parents and community spaces, right? And so engaging community members in, um, and, and, and homework, right? And so having students have to do interview projects that include family members. And if their family members don't speak English, well then they should be conducting those interviews in languages that the parents or family members actually speak, right? And that's okay and that's wonderful. You may not be able to speak those languages, but the kids can, right? And they can translate things for you if you need it, right? They can provide a summary of what the interview was in English, maybe, so that you can read it and see what it was. And so what I'm trying to emphasize here is that you don't need to speak the languages of the student in order to be able to affirm their body and multilingualism, right? That that's something you can do even just speaking only one language if you do only speak one language. Um, and thinking about multilingual school and classroom libraries. And so if you have 10 languages in your class, then why is your um, library all in English, right? Um, encourage students to read in their home language, but also encourage students to read in languages that they don't speak, right? I'm not encouraging them to do that every time they do independent reading. But on occasion, if they read in a language that's not their own, it may help develop their metalinguistic skills, right? Especially if they're reading in a language that, for example, has a different script than English. Just looking at that as an elementary school student is a way of building language awareness and the differences between languages, right? And oftentimes, if you pair students who don't speak the language with students who do, that can also facilitate metalinguistic conversations that students are doing their stations or whatever it is that they may be doing with the book. Um, kind of um, bringing in family and community members as, as, as guest readers, guest speakers, guest teachers, um, including the families in what it is that you do. And again, if they don't speak English, well, you have tons of students in your classroom that are bilingual, right, who can translate what the parents are saying. Um, and that's another way of valuing their bilingualism, even if you can't communicate directly with the parents. So oftentimes, there are lots of nonverbal ways that you can communicate with people that then actually treat them as human beings, right? And so sometimes I think, um, this is a little bit of a tangent, but sometimes when a translator comes into the room, the instinct is that you get to talk to the translator, right? Um, you shouldn't do that. You should be talking to the parent, and then the translator should be translating whatever it is that you said. But you want to make sure that the parent understands that you're actually speaking to them, and you recognize that they are invested in their child's education, and that they're there to talk to you, right? Not to the translator. The translator is just there to help them understand what it is that you're saying to them. Um, do we have a community walk? Um, and kind of thinking about the multilingualism of the community itself, and that kind of gets to another thing. So these are a little um, repetitive here, but thinking about multilingual independent reading, right? And independent reading books in all the languages available to the school and encouraging people to, uh, on occasion to take a book that may be in a language they don't understand. To see, for example, if you're looking at a text in Spanish, some of those words may be uh, not that unfamiliar to you. Maybe you can figure some of those words out based on your English skills because there are some similarities between English and Spanish, right? Um, and so incorporating bilingual writers and bilingual writing in the ways that we did um, in the Abuela unit. Um, again, you don't have to speak the languages of the students to encourage them to, to create a project like that where they're illustrating their bilingual identities and they're trying to authentically represent their parents and their families and their community. You can even have as a requirement that they have to provide clues in the text for you because you have to think about audience, right? 
And so if your audience is an audience of a teacher who doesn't speak that language, then of course that means as a language architect, you have to construct the text in a way that's going to allow the teacher to understand, right? Again, a way of doing it that doesn't require you to have proficiency in the languages. Um, and thinking about the way that um, early, older elementary school students can really begin to think more deeply about the author's use of translating over rhetorical strategies, right? So in the second grade class that I work with, it was primarily just making them aware that this was something that they could do. And the upper grades, you could really have much more in-depth, kind of complicated conversations about these things. And then thinking about community land, language studies, right? And so in many communities in Philadelphia, and I'm sure in other urban areas, um, there are lots of signs in languages other than English, right? There's a whole body of literature in sociolinguistics that focuses on linguistic landscapes, right? Um, people research this. So why not have students be researchers in this kind of community and really think about what languages are visible in the community, what languages are signed in, um, thinking about kind of governmental and official businesses, thinking about kind of commercial chain religious institutions, um, what are the messages of the different signs? And again, here you could position your students as experts because if certain students have proficiency in certain languages, they may be able to tell you what some of these signs mean, even if they can't necessarily read them, right? Because they may understand, well, we go into that store to get my hair cut, right? So um, they might not be able to read the sign, but they can still give you information about how people in their community use these institutions, right? Um, and then really, this is kind of me being like really like, in the sky, but I think it would be great to have like a um, multilingual, multilingual awareness curriculum where like just four times a year, for right, two hours, you can just immerse students in a language that's different than one that they've ever heard before. Um, and all students can be randomly assigned to different languages and cultures. Parents and teachers can work on projects. And, and just to give them, all of them, an experience of having to work in a language that they don't understand, right? And to see the challenges and difficulties that come with that, to allow them to become more empathetic to people who are in their classes and are kind of struggling through that every day, right? Um, and so kind of just revisiting, kind of to kind of end this presentation, this visionary framing that I talked about, right? And I want to revisit it to kind of hope that some of it at least makes more sense now. So moving away from English learner, which of course is a term that we have to use when we're talking to like policy because that's a policy description. But I mean, in our own classes, we don't have to describe our students that way. Um, to report, we have to. But why, what would happen if we decided to call our students bilingual or multilingual instead of English language learner, right? What, that, what made that change in the way that we understand our students and the way that we approach our students? Um, and again, rather than saying students don't have a strong foundation in any language, really acknowledging the metalinguistic conversations that students are already engaged in, and I gave you some examples of the interesting things children of young children are already doing, so you know older children are definitely doing it too, um, and using those as a starting point for all of the things that we're doing in our classroom, and really beginning with the student experience and helping to connect the metalinguistic conversations that they already engage with with new types of metalinguistic conversations that are exposing them to new types of language practices. Um, and again, rather than talking about them as lacking in academic language, really thinking about them as engaged in language architecture, right? And, and how that reframe may help us to really see the language practices of our students differently, right? Um, and the reason that I say that is because I think sometimes the ways that people take up the term academic language is usually to describe students as not having it, right? Um, and when I talk to teachers and ask them what they mean by academic language, oftentimes they're not really clear <laughs> what they mean by it. Um, and so, what I'm suggesting is that if we reframe in terms of language architecture, we can begin perhaps more precise in what we mean when we say we want them to learn academic language. Right? We would reframe to say, wait, let's look at the language architecture of these particular texts that we're engaging with and really look closely at the linguistic features of these particular texts that may or may not be academic. Right? Um, and rather than seeing them as speaking it properly, to really think about the ways that they already shift audience and understand audience um, and, and how they could perhaps, how you as a teacher can help guide them to be able to come, become even more effective at engaging with different audiences that they may be unfamiliar with. Um, and so I want to end by saying that what I'm talking about here 
isn't just about bilingualism and multilingualism, right? I think what I'm saying is just about language diversity and education more broadly. And so I wanted to end with a quote from James Baldwin from his famous essay, of Black English Isn't a Language, and tell me what is. And he said, a child cannot be taught by anyone whose demand essentially is that the child repudiate his experience and all that gives him sustenance and enter a limbo in which he will no longer be black and in which he knows that he can never become white. Um, and so when we're talking about bilingualism and multilingualism, as I said, it can help us to also reframe all of the work that we're doing in classrooms. Because certainly language diversity isn't just about languages other than English, it's also about English. And there are diverse ways of using English. And when we tell students that their ways of using English are wrong, we're telling them to repudiate their identities, right? And so rather than do that, we really have to think about how it is we can support all of our students in becoming language architects who are able to construct language in ways that reflect who they are as people. This is what I think James Baldwin is doing here. Um, so that's us. Thank you.